Hello, my name is Sascha Preidisch and I decided to show my face before I uh, start with my video. Uh, I'm going to explain a new uh, topic in the context of OAuth and I hope you'll enjoy it. Hello everyone, so today I'll explain how OAuth 2 rich authorization requests work. This should be a short video, it's a very straightforward RFC in this case RFC 9396 and I hope you learn something in this video. So before we get really into it, here are a few highlights. RA, Rich Authorization Requests, is in addition to the OAuth protocol and it can be used with OAuth and OpenID Connect and it is meant to add the ability to request uh, detailed permissions from resource owners. The parameter authorization details contains one or multiple requested details. And the idea is to use this in addition to OAuth scope values. Where OAuth scope values are very uh, limited in a way where they refer to something like email or profile uh, and it's not really detailed. Whereas this spec allows a client to request as many details as it needs in order for a user to grant or deny a request. Okay, so here's our example for this video. This is taken right out of the RFC. And as you may see, this is a uh, JSON payload. And um, these curly brackets reference one authorization detail and this is part of a list. So this request could have many requested details at the same time. Important to know about this example is the following. Only the type key is required. And in this case, it's called payment initiation. And all other keys, the whole rest of this payload is um, specific to a use case. So the RFC doesn't uh, provide a fixed, let's say frame or a fixed JSON payload for this spec. It only says, well, you have to specify the type because uh, type is needed for an authorization server and then later for a resource server to decide what to do with this payload. And uh, the payload has to match this type. So this is a, uh, use case specific implementation and most likely specific on a certain domain only. The spec suggests that the keys like locations, which we have in this example here, which is referring to a resource server, which will handle payments in this case. Data types, identifier and privileges as common fields, even though they are not in this example, but the idea is that many use cases will uh, need to take these keys into consideration for their payload. They seem to be very typical. But other than that, the design and the structure of this document is totally up to the use case. So something that I already mentioned, these, um, the content of authorization details has to be understood by the authorization server and by the resource server. So the uh, authorization server will receive the request that includes the author authorization details and the authorization server has to be able to process the details into a human readable message so that a user understands what the request is. In addition, once the user granted this request, the authorization server has to uh, persist the given grant or the consent um, into its concept management uh, system just as it does for scope values and it should be able to distinguish between an authorization detail that has been requested in the past so that it knows if it's equal or different. Um, so this enables an authorization server to potentially skip the uh, consent screen or the approval screen as it is able to skip it when the same client requests the same scope or a shorter list of earlier requested scopes. And then of course, once the user granted a request with authorization details, 
the uh, client will use an access token against a resource server and this resource server has to be able to understand the content of the authorization details in a business context so like in this example where we use a payment request this uh, resource server has to understand that this is a payment request and it has to understand that this most likely can only be used once since users will only pay uh, an item uh, one time and not multiple times so both of these servers have to be built so that they do understand the same authorization details okay let's have a look how this looks uh, in i would almost say real life how it looks in an authorization request so the client prepares an authorization request, sends it to authorization server to the authorized endpoint and includes parameters such as client ID, scope, in this case scope open ID, just as an example. And for this RFC, additionally, the authorization details as a URL encoded value as, uh, as with all other parameter values. And now, when this authorization server receives this request, as I mentioned earlier, it has to be able to process um, this message into something that a user is able to understand. Most users will not know what a JSON payload is, and it's not really useful uh, to just display it. So if we go back a few slides, <clears throat> we'll see that our payment request has um, a currency and an amount and it also has a merchant name and it has a reference number. So in this example, the authorization server takes those details and turns them into uh, a screen which says um, application XYZ is requesting access to these details of yours, so the user ID, which is derived from the requested scope open ID. And then of course, our authorization details are turned into this message and approval for this payment. Recipient, merchant A, amount, uh, euros 123.50, and the reference number. And now the user or the resource owner is able to make a decision based on what is displayed and can then either deny or grant the request. And even though this example is uh, based on a payment, this of course could be anything that matches any use case where these types of details need to be uh, requested from a user. After you, the user grants the request, the authorization server returns a, a typical OAuth slash OpenID connect response to the client. It includes an access token, potentially a refresh token, ID token, the granted scope, the uh, lifetime for the access token, and of course, the granted authorization details. And um, this is the token response. However, these details um, need to be made available to the resource server later. So uh, in one case, if the issued access token is a JSON Web Token based token, then these details can be included in the access token. If it's just a string as a reference token, then the resource server needs to be able to receive the authorization details uh, through the introspection endpoint. Um, so these details are available or should be available of uh, at least twice in the client, in the response to the client within the access token and or through the introspection endpoint. So once the access token was issued, the client will use it against the resource server, in this case against our example payments endpoint. And this resource server will take the access token and will either find the authorization details within the token, if it's a JSON web token based token or by calling the introspection endpoint. And then it has to process those details uh, according to the business logic. And this, of course, is a very important part of this whole setup. So this is why it's important to 
to uh, manage this implementation of this JSON-based payload uh, for the authorization server and the resource server. And one very important aspect, of course, is that the resource server um, needs to be able to know if it's a one-time um, processing request only, if it can be used once only. And in order for the resource server to make this work or to make this decision, it's important to design the payload to include a unique value, like a reference number that can be used only once, like an ordering number or whatever it may be. Yeah, and uh, this is it, I would say. There's um, my summary. So this, um, this RFC is very useful if the scope by itself is not sufficient enough to receive permissions of users. And it can be used with any use case, which is really nice, since the payload is uh, totally up to, up to you. And it's good practice to specify the type value as a URI to uh, avoid naming conflicts. If, for example, we would stick to the name payment initiation, uh, but the resource server would be a service that is able to handle multiple payment initiation types, then it is important that uh, each one refers to a unique name. If you want to learn more, check out the RFC 9396 and also the FAPI2 security profile, Financial APIs 2.0. They reference um, authorization requests as a tool to request details from users and payments. It could be very long, there could be account information or whatever it may be. As usual, please leave a comment if you have questions or if you liked the video or if you didn't like it or if you have an idea for a future video. Um, try to watch my other videos. Check out Buy Me A Coffee if you liked it. Subscribe. And if you want to read more about API development, you may also want to check out my book. That's it for today. Thank you very much.